Welcome to NinjaCast, a photography podcast powered by Studio Ninja, the world's highest rated business management app built specifically for photographers. Listen and learn as the most successful photographers on the planet share their knowledge to help you transform every element of your photography business. Here's your host, Sally Shaw. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of NinjaCast. Today I'm joined by the lovely Karen of Photo SEO Lab. I'm really excited for this one. I am a total SEO technophobe, so I know that I'm gonna learn as much as you guys are on this one. We're gonna be covering everything from delving into your SEO, your website speed, top tips for people who have never even looked at their SEO and don't know where to start, and also just general tips for how you can move forward after this podcast and go and implement things right away. Let's get started. Hi Karen, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited about today. Uh, This is uh, a bit of an exciting one for me because SEO is not my strong point, so I'm going to learn tons. (laughs) Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm hoping as many people as possible. For our listeners, Karen, that don't know much about you, can you kind of give yourself a bit of an introduction, kind of tell us about you? Yes, I am a wedding photographer. I established my business back in 2015, so it's 16 years old now. And I first got into SEO in 2007. So both of those things have kind of um, followed a, a, a kind of similar uh, growth tangent, I guess. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I'm currently based in Glasgow, although I've spent most of my wedding photography career in Manchester. Amazing. Fantastic. That's great. And in terms of your career and your journey in your career, can you delve into a little bit of that for us too? Sure. Well, it's the most ridiculous thing, really. (laughs) Um, Right. No one listen to this. Tell anyone else. Okay. Uh, So I was, um, when I was at school, um, they had uh, vocational courses for anyone who wasn't quite 16 years old yet um, during exam time. Uh, if you're under 16, you still had to have a full timetable. Anyway, uh-huh. so that, I'm, I'm kind of building up to a justification for why I ended up in this <laughs> situation. Um, and what happened, they had all these like fun vocational courses just so that kind of legally you still had a full timetable, but you weren't being distracted from studying. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why I ended up with a qualification in both photography and trampolining in school. <laughs> Oh my goodness. (laughs) Because those were the only two things left over. And I had never even thought about photography before or trampolining. Um, (laughs) So I guess my career could have went in a very different direction. Um, (laughs) We could have been watching you on the Olympics. (laughs) Yeah, I was never that good. Somersaults were always a little bit of a a risk, really a health and safety (laughs) risk. Um, So that's how I kind of got into photography. And I just kind of fell in love with it, as many people do. Um, And ended up going on to college to study I'd done a kind of foundational degree so it was really practical we got to try out lots of different things from everything from kind of like medical and forensic uh, type techniques to fashion photography and architecture and editorial so it was a lot of fun really. Amazing it sounds like you really got to kind of test out all the different areas of photography before kind of making your final choice on um, you know becoming a photographer in the area that you chose. Yeah, if anything, I just didn't know what to do with myself when I finished college because there was so much choice almost and there was areas that I was really attracted to. But I I think it it, kind of 19 years old, you know, you just, I just didn't really know. And I didn't know how to run a business. The one thing I did know is that I wanted to be self-employed and I didn't want to work for anyone else. Mm -hmm. But we we had had a module on that, but running a business is is hard. And what I ended up doing instead was taking a, a little bit of a career detour and I get into um, management uh, in my retail career. Uh, well, I had a part-time job in a photography shop at college and that kind of escalated. And that was kind of beneficial in learning how to run a business and things like profit and loss and uh-huh. um, marketing, because as we both know, without marketing, you're not going to get very far at all. It's going to be a real challenge. And it's um, not the easiest bit, is it? <laughs> it's not. It's the hardest bit. I mean, if, if anything, I mean, I wouldn't, change the the degree I've done for the world because it was so practical and it was I, I still benefit from that today you know the the things that we learned um but really the marketing component should have been stronger and I kind of wish I went on to do marketing as a course afterwards I think the retail management career did help with thinking about those types of things but even then I mean it's uh, the, the, the marketing is just such a, a crucial part of running a successful business that 
if I had to choose between two degrees, you know, the marketing would be a a pretty strong contender, really. And I have, um, you know, as someone that's experienced, I'm sure you have this as well, where people get in touch and maybe they're just starting out in the industry and they'll be asking advice and I'll be like, marketing, Uh (laughs) you know. Absolutely. Obviously, you've you've kind of gone through that journey that a new photographer, you know, would go through essentially you know there's a lot of people in our industry that might have kind of you know they've always had a camera on them or you know photography has always been something that they knew they wanted to do but that was a little bit different for you so what would you what would your advice be to photographers that are kind of just starting out they've just come into this big wide world of the industry and gone oh my goodness (laughs) well um just so you can learn from some of my mistakes I think the first thing I'd say is don't buy kit right away which Mm -hmm. might sound a bit contradictory or a bit what um the money I wasted Sally on when I tried to buy cheap lenses and then it's not until you're shooting and the, that you're editing the work that you realize that the colors are different and they're never going to match mm-hmm. and you're in this situation where you're like these things look so different um so cutting corners really just didn't work and I ended up um having to spend more money if I could go back and do that again I would hire kit before I bought anything and I would hire different lenses even now I never buy a lens until I've used it on at least two or three weddings. And I do that by hiring it. And I guess, you know, there's more higher um, options available now than there was back in 2005. In 2005, it was really just Calumet, which doesn't exist anymore. I feel very old. Um, But, you know, there are these companies online uh, that are offered kind of lots of different kit. And I think really the benefit of when you're new of hiring different things is you can kind of really start finding your groove with how you want to um, e- express your creativity through photos because everybody's a bit different and it's so, easy in a, it's so easy in a Facebook group to think okay this is the correct thing to do but actually in terms of how you shoot and what you create um, if you want to create something that's a bit unique then giving yourself the the, the space to really kind of express yourself and, and play really, you know, that, that, that kind of space to uh, test out creative ideas, I think is such a, a crucial part. So I think don't buy anything. <laughs> it's my... <laughs> you know I did I did the exact same thing and I I remember being on a Facebook group and seeing that everyone was using the 35-85 combo everybody and I was like well that must be the go-to lenses that's what I need to get um and then from there I was like well now everyone's using the 70-200 so I must like obviously I need a 70-200 for a wedding um so I went out and bought that um and I think I used that 70-200 five times and then was like yeah it's not for me I'm a close (laughs) close up kind of person not a shoot from the distance kind of person um and it's a waste of a lens as well it's like 1.2 kilograms or something so that that's a lot of weight to carry around for 10 hours when it's a mistake yeah (laughs) you know and and the same I I bought one of those lenses um um, it mainly just acted it looked cool in my hip you know you know when you're, you're wearing it and you've got this big white lens and you're like I'm kind of a big deal this, um, this makes me a photographer <laughs> yeah it's but it's the, fun, the fun kind of usefulness of it at a wedding uh, yeah I guess I, I like kind of working closer with people as well and really kind of being able to to bounce off people when I'm um, kind of doing photos I don't want to be in like the next field yeah it's that interaction I find isn't it I think that's that's the thing that I really enjoy capturing when I'm out at a wedding or I'm doing a shoot is being that close that you get to be part of that interaction while still documenting it at the same time you can't do that with a 70 to 200 when you're way back you can and I think you can still be kind of blend in and kind of do some ninja stuff and and be unobtrusive with a closer lens you just need to be kind of a bit more subtle I think yeah I like the way that you can flip between the two being quickly you know if you want to just influence something or um something's in you know I, I tend to try and shoot as kind of naturally and unobtrusively as possible um but that that's just being slightly closer up um it just feels a bit more intimate as well I think in terms of some of the reactions whereas you know, you see more of the background, whereas in a longer focal length, it's it starts getting a little bit like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's just not for me. Definitely. But I've been there. I wasted the money. I walked around with the extra weights. <laughs> I had the free workout. <laughs> it looked good. We've all done it. We've all done it. All I know that everyone will be listening to that going guilty. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rite of passage, I think. You need to. Yeah. 
and it's probably the same 70 to 200 that's just been sold amongst the photographers <laughs> that we've all we've all just had a shot of for at least three or four weddings before Absolutely. going you know, <laughs> so our listeners may not know about you and um, Karen that you are the founder of the photo SEO lab so I'm really excited to kind of focus more on this can you tell us a little bit more detail about what you do and how you help photographers all over the world yes um I got into SEO myself as I said earlier on because I needed to find a way to be found online and as we know marketing is really expensive so SEO or search engine optimization as a way of your kind of ideal client just being able to find you organically through using search mm-hmm. um so that turned out to be a great matchmaker because I love the kind of small intimate city weddings and urban spaces and I was able to kind of connect with those people through search engine optimization and google um, but it really kind of helping other people really only arose because I had friends in the industry that were paying seo companies and it felt like they were being taken advantage of. You know, as creatives, we have a lot of technophobes in this industry who are maybe kind of more on the creative than technical side. Mm -hmm. And initially, you know, having friends talk to me and say, I've paid this money for this company, things aren't improving, but I see your website everywhere. Like, what's going on here? And then checking those sites and being things weren't right. Um, So it really kind of started off from helping friends and then friends of friends and then things escalate. Um, Then in 2016, I started working with a a big US agency, worked with hundreds of photographers, including your good self. Um, (laughs) And uh, as you know, I kind of love that problem solving side of things. Um, And then in 2019, I started my own agency because I really wanted an approach where I could um, work live with clients. Mm -hmm. Um, So the the approach that I have to SEO with photographers specifically is a a kind of coaching and technical SEO hybrid where I'm doing all the complicated stuff, um, but everything is done live. So it's very kind of coaching based and focused on helping empower photographers so that you know exactly what is wrong. Um, Things can be fixed for you without you having to worry about that, but then you understand kind of best practice going forward. And what that means is that small business owners, like as photographers, I mean, our expenses are crazy. You know, the software costs are insane. The insurance costs are insane. You know, our kit isn't cheap. It's not exactly like a super high margin business. So Mm -hmm. a lot of larger um, or kind of alternative structure businesses would um, maybe pay for ongoing SEO help um, but that's not really kind of practical when the content you're creating is so personal to your ideal clients so personal in terms of your experiences and um, with your photography work so it's, it's kind of really crucial to have that knowledge and understanding to be able to really get your personality um, and create useful content that's going to kind of help people so it's almost like I think an integral part of having a photography business to to be able to have those skills so that's something that kind of over time um I hadn't really intended to uh, start my own business when I did but circumstances happened that way Here we are um, <laughs> and you know I've, I've got lots of happy clients and some great results for people so it's been it's been a kind of um uh, a fun journey but then my, I guess that's the the kind of key difference really with my the, the kind of hybrid coaching technical SEO model really yeah definitely it's I know I hear your name a lot in the in the industry amongst photographers in regards to SEO and you know if someone's got an SEO question or a problem you're always the one to be tagged in the groups you're always the one to say you know go and check out Karen's website she'll be able to help you I think it's such a although so integral to our businesses and it is such an important factor it's also a factor that even now I still think oh god SEO no thank you I'd rather not (laughs) and I know that you know I speak for so many photographers when I say that I know that so many of us out there just go oh no I don't I don't understand it I don't know how to do it so the fact that you take it and actually kind of coach people and teach them well this is the problem and this is how we get to the solution and you see all those steps actually I think is a bit of a game changer because I think that photographers are going to start to learn so much more about a really important part of their business absolutely and in terms of kind of um, really kind of get in front of your ideal client it, it will kind of create more of a difference between you and your competitors because there might be lots of 
photographers in Glasgow or Manchester, but we're not all aiming for the same things. Mm -hmm. You know, some of us like golf club weddings. I'm not judging. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Every wedding photographer that's listening to this right now is just like, oh my goodness, yes. Um, <laughs> And knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's like um, the unspoken. <laughs> it's, the, it's the unspoken kind of. Um, uh, and, and yeah, anyway. Uh, so that kind of empowerment and education, I think, is is so important. And it helps almost minimise the competition. Because if you can kind of get more of your ideal client, then, you know, not everybody's clambering over the, the same keywords and things, you know. Absolutely. So obviously when we we're going to kind of start to delve into different elements of SEO now and all the different kind of key parts of things that you may find that you work with people more regularly. The first one for me, and it's funny that this is one of our questions actually, because I was just looking into this on my own website last week. Website speed is a bit of a buzzword. It's again, something that people go, well, yeah, obviously I want my website to load super quick and, you know, it's filled with images with, you know, what we do as a job. Um, but actually it's, it can be quite hard to achieve. You know, my, I, I looked at my website the other week, I think I ran it through some, um, some tests to see where it would come, come up at. And it was like an F it was like rated super low. It was like really laggy, really slow. <laughs> And I was like, right, well, that's great, but I don't know what to do with that to, to, to speed it up now. So what would you say that photographers can do to, A, you know, even be aware of that in the first place, but then B, to actually increase their website speed and act on that? So there's a couple of different things with this because it is a huge buzzword at the moment. And what I want to say right away is I feel that there are um, people uh, in the industry that want to take advantage of this kind of, um, I think, bit of a focus on speed that ties in with the core web vitals that are being released yeah um so my initial tip for everybody is just keep your money in your pocket um speed potentially isn't the the big thing you think it is because you know if you've got 40 50 photos on a blog post so have your competitors you know photography websites aren't going to just get rid of their photos overnight they yeah. are going to be slower to load We're, our photos are, are what kind of books us work and i think as well it's in kind of expectations influence things because if I'm going to be loading a photo heavy website I'm going to be expecting it's going to take a little bit longer to load you know but saying that there are some real kind of quick wins that you do not need to invest in a speed course you do not need to spend any money on that are just very kind of simple practical steps so I thought I'd share those with you That'd be great. Um, one of the first things you can do is speak to your hosting company because I see a lot of things getting recommended in Facebook groups about things like cash plugins. But if you've got a server side cash in your hosting, adding a cash plugin is going to slow things right down and cause you all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. So speaking to your hosting company first and asking if there's any um, cash on the server side, finding out what the kind of how powerful your hosting is. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's compatible with everything you're using. Oh my goodness, I've spoken to hosting companies that I've asked those questions and said, actually, we don't recommend this particular level for this particular theme. We recommend this instead. But when you sign up for hosting, you might have been on a different theme. You know, those questions might not have been asked. So you can end up in something unsuitable where the best thing you can do is have a conversation with tech support that could make a big difference for you mm -hmm. rather than you worrying about how many photos you've got on your homepage, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like anything else, it kind of, um, like a, a car and in terms of its power, it kind of starts from the engine. So the first thing to deal with is your hosting, whether everything that you're using on your site is compatible, getting your hosting company to maybe do a quick check, see if there's any issues. Um, if you've got incompatibilities with plugins, then often that can show up in server locks. But hosting companies aren't going to just be reaching out to you, or typically, not, not usually yeah. anyway, and saying, oh, by the way, we've noticed this. So, but raising a support ticket, asking those questions, seeing if they see anything that might be slowing things down is a, a really good way to just make quite a big difference quite quickly without you having to really do much other than ask the question. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'd start. I think the next stage would be um, in terms of all the, the things that get added to a website over time. Step two would be a plugin audit. The websites I have seen were photographers where they added a gallery plugin, then thought, no, that's not quite what I'm looking for. And then added another one. 
and then added another one. And the time that we have a conversation three years later, they're like, one of these is being used and I don't know which one. <laughs> so that's so neat. <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't gonna I wasn't gonna name uh, mention your name um, oh, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm self-confessed like absolutely terrible <laughs> but so many photographers do the same thing and the thing is with all those those plugins they're all bits of software on that server and every time your website loads all these scripts are running even if they're not used mm-hmm. so having a whole bunch of stuff on there that you're not using can really slow things down and it can be causing little conflicts that you might not realize it might not be like bad enough for you to take your website on offline but you've maybe got things that are doing similar things at the same time that are then slowing down that whole process mm. so step two would be a plug-in audit go through every single one do you need it if you've got a bunch of galleries and you don't know which one is working then just set aside an hour or two to figure it out you can switch off each plug-in one by one find out what it breaks if like a few photographers I've dealt with recently you're using two different plugins for different aspects of your website then maybe you just need to stick to the one mm-hmm. <laughs> you know uh, choose the one you like uh, you don't need a selection so doing a plug-in audit and having as few plugins on there as possible think about it as driving around with luggage in your car your fuel economy is going to suck. You know, it's not, it's not beneficial. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you're a wedding photographer and you need all that stuff, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's, those, that's those 70 to 200. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh no, I always wore that though. It, it was worth it. <laughs> um, so following on from that, I would say there's things that you can do just as best practice to keep things lighter. So avoid fancy sliders, you know, have static photos, make sure your photos are, not larger than necessary so the browser isn't having to resize things um try not to have like 100 photos in a blog post it's it's not gonna help you if you have a whole load of photos in a blog post and your bounce rate is high those things are not unconnected um i I know it's really hard choosing photos it's the hardest thing so i I typically say you know choose an amount of photos that mean that your your blog post can load and as close to two seconds as possible, if not less. Mm-hmm. Um, there are sort of features you can use like lazy loading of images and um, different kind of uh, theme optimization kind of options, different themes have got different kind of possibilities there. But a lot of improvement can be made with the simple hosting improvements, plug in audit and not using a slider. So those three things are simple things that li- literally anybody could do today without needing to invest in a course. Um, or you know spend any money and it just takes a little bit of time and going through things and um, you know m- making sure that uh, you can kind of check check what's doing what and what you need so based on those points I've got two things I can go away and do so I've not contacted my host I didn't even think of contacting my hosting provider at all so that's one for me and that's I have at the top of my website a massive slider like a full page slider um, that goes through maybe 12 to 15 images on a little rotation um, and last week I did the plug-in thing that was something that I'd um, found out and went through and like deleted so many that were just sat there that I'd just gone oh that looks pretty or that might work oh no it doesn't work but it never never got removed it just stayed there. <laughs> so did that make a difference for you though when the before yeah. and after of the plugins so with the plugins I went from um I think I was loading in about six or seven seconds and I'm down to about just after three now um so you see, it can be that significant yeah. and it's all those little scripts that we don't see they're invisible you know but we maybe don't realize kind of what they're doing in the background yeah absolutely and, you know, the slider thing with those 12 images when you have a slider they all need to load up before the rest of the site is loading up so that's a lot of that's a lot of stuff yeah maybe reducing the amount of images that's where your s is coming from i'd hedge a bit that if you if you change that to static image you're going to be at least a c yeah absolutely i think i got it to i think i was back to an e was it an e or a d it was somewhere around there um but now i'm i'm one of those people that i see things that are color coordinated and i want to get it to green so on this website that I'd use, like F was obviously red. And I think now I'm in like an orange yellow stage. So now I'm like, no, that really needs to be green. So I need to do something to get that to green. <laughs> and what I would say about that, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I feel like there is this focus on 
if things are green, then I'm going to be getting found by people and I'm going to rank. Actually, that's not strictly true. You know, we can get double green results from Yoast by just creating something in Latin that makes no sense to anybody. Yes. And that's not going to help us book more weddings. So I think there is sometimes a bit of a, uh, we can get distracted, you know, or in this, and I don't know if false sense of security is the word, you know, where actually the difference that might make getting from a C to an A isn't really enough to make a difference in terms of us, you know, earning more as photographers or booking more of our clients. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because it's such a kind of clear thing to focus on, it can end up taking up more time than it should. Yeah. Um, whereas focusing on content and whether your content is matching what people are searching for, really thinking about your buyer persona, you know, your, your kind of target person that you would love to work with mm -hmm. and what they're searching for, how you can solve their problems even if your content is slower, that's going to be a more successful approach. Yeah. But it's a little bit more of a kind of less concise, vaguer thing that might take a little bit more time to achieve over weeks and months. So I think this is why um, the speed thing can be such a kind of, right, I just need to get an A and my life will be complete. Everything <laughs> will be fine. Um, so I just caution uh, anybody that's listening to this that is kind of wanting to improve things in terms of book more weddings don't neglect your content the content is always more important yeah. you know my website does not get the highest scores out there but I book the weddings that I want to book mm -hmm. and I, I still rank well um partly still in the wrong city because I moved fairly recently yeah. just before the pandemic but that's a different thing <laughs> That's a good point, actually, Karen. So, you know, there's people that do relocate, you know, there's photographers that have established businesses, say, in Manchester, and actually, um, you know, they move down south, they move to Essex, say. Um, that's, it's like a whole different starting again, isn't it? You know, having to, or it seems to be, it's, it's essentially kind of starting your business all over again. Absolutely. And um, I think I had experience of moving before. Um, I'm collating a bit of a, a, a free mini, is a mini course, but really it's a kind of extended blog on kind of some best practices to do while moving. Oh, so hey. that's going to be live at one point next week. Oh. Um, and really having the, um, the kind of content uh, for your venues kind of I didn't explain that very well but essentially doing research of venues you'd like to to work at mm -hmm. and um checking where's got the kind of best search volume where's maybe the lower lower competition and creating a strategy around creating content for that kind of specific audience and that's what I've done when I moved to Glasgow and why I've been able to get quite a lot of bookings despite the fact that there's a global pandemic um and I've still got a lot of wrong content on my website in terms of the, you know, it's, it's the wrong city. But I had a very clear idea of where I like to shoot and where I wanted to target. Um, and that's enabled me to kind of get the work at the right place rather than, um, you know, trying to uh, or not not being found by certain places. So, yeah. uh, so there I will be a... There's a crossover there as well, isn't there? That, you know, I presume there was a a time period where you were traveling back to Manchester for weddings and things like that, where people were still finding you and still wanting to book you and things like that. Yeah. And it was so difficult because I was turning down work in Manchester. And this is one of the reasons that I'd strongly recommend anyone new to the industry collaborate with others, because I was able to pass work to trusted colleagues that I knew had a similar shooting style to me. And um, then that, that client felt, you know, it was a bit of a better experience rather than me just saying, no, I'm not available. So it's really hard turning down work in your previous city um, and creating content in your new city I would say use existing work that you've got to show your new city your skills and your talents and your style yeah. um, I think there is this kind of mental barrier we have as photographers where we feel uncomfortable about creating content around um, new areas we want to shoot but with our older content and do you know what a park is a park a botanic garden is a botanic gardens and yeah. We can share, share our style and our of portraits or our approach to group photos or our kind of documentary um, style, which I know is popular with everybody pretty much. Um, we don't need to wait to get work in our new city. And I think working with hundreds of photographers over the past few years with SEO, 
I have seen that as a bit of a barrier when photographers move to somewhere new. They say, well, how do I get the work? Because I don't have any work from here. Mm. And I'm like, you've got thousands of photos that showcase your talents. Yeah. So put them out there and show them to people. Mm. Um, I think just transparency is important. You know, I've created pages for venues in my new city and I've illustrated those pages with existing work. And I've been quite clear that that work is not from a new city. I mean, anyone would know that that is not, you know, uh, the botanic gardens that we're talking about. It might, you know, yeah. there might, but I've been in different botanic gardens. So I think um, I just wanted to really share that with the, the community because it makes moving much easier mm -hmm. if you're not putting those barriers of, I don't have any work to share. Actually, you do. You've got loads. Yeah. So definitely. go share it with your new city. <laughs> So anyone that's planning on moving, there's your little how-to. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Love it. So what would be your top tips for our listeners in terms of websites in general? I know we've just given kind of a bit of a, a website speed top tips of things you can go away and do right away. Let's talk more generally about your website in general. What can people go away and just go, right, I need to do this? So the thing I think is worth remembering, especially for wedding photographers, is that most people are not going to type in London wedding photographer or Essex wedding photographer they're just going to type in wedding photographer and then Google's going to show them the wedding photographers that are near them mm -hmm. so having your location on your site is really important because people are just typing in as few words as possible you know they're they haven't had the course on what keywords are good <laughs> they, they don't get the memo and all the kind of industry <laughs> insider stuff so making it really clear on your website where you're based what you do what's your style and approach stops any misunderstanding because again people that are booking wedding photographers have often not done that before I think it's a little bit different for um, family photographers or like your newborn born clients because you can have that multi kind of contact with the same person and almost educate them about how things work yeah and I think that's really helpful you know as wedding photographers we don't have that luxury so we need to make things really simple and um, make our kind of what we're aiming for just really clear mm -hmm. uh, and so that there's no misunderstanding and um, explaining what documentary photography is for example or what creative portraits are like um <clears throat> we not assuming that the this kind of general public know anything about photography or, or weddings is probably the best mm -hmm. um the best approach so having that bit of text on your website that explains things is going to help people understand what you're you're all about mm -hmm. um, but also help Google Play Matchmaker as well, you know, with getting your site in front of the right people. Yeah. So I think that clear labeling um, of what you're aiming for and then targeting um, maybe things that you are drawn to. Like I love urban city weddings. Mm -hmm. So creating content around that is going to help you get in front of those people that you're going to be a good match with. And then you're going to have a lot of fun in the wedding day. Yeah. All of a sudden, a golf club. It, it kind of yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're going to those dream <laughs> venues and those weddings. Absolutely. You think that's my ideal client, and you're shooting them all the time. Yeah, and they will pick up on that passion. You know, I love these little, um, intimate, uh, like kind of te terrace townhouse type pub weddings and that type of thing, yeah. and they're so much fun. And ideally, you know, clients that are booking somebody will really want to book photographers that are really passionate about that thing. So it's just, there's no point doing things that um, are aiming to do things that you feel that like you maybe have to do when you don't at all. So having a niche and kind of focusing on what you love and um, what you're really passionate about, I think is, is the way forward. And then being really clear about that message in terms of what you're aiming for. Amazing. That's great. If um, photographers were to come to you and they were to say, that their website is just not working um you know they need to change platform in order to rank well on google they're not ranking it must be the platform that they're using what would you say to these people so often that is just not true at all <clears throat> now some platforms do have limitations um and kind of the weird kind of you know i'm thinking of the best way to explain this you've got quirks quirk is the right word yeah. um so I would say choose a platform that you can create content on and that you find easy to work. Mm -hmm. Whilst some of them are really restrictive, more often than not, um, with, you know, Wix, Squarespace, um, I mean, WordPress is, is probably the, the ideal thing that I would recommend. Yeah. Um, but the platform isn't what's going to kind of get you 
on page one, really. It's the content that you create and how that content is labeled. So as long as you can have kind of clarity over letting Google know what's the main title of the page, what are your subheadings? Mm -hmm. And if, as long as Google can kind of read the alt text and see things like schema, um, schema is uh, almost like a kind of barcode for your website where you can present information in a kind of structured way that says to Google, this is me, this is my organization. Here's like my logo and my details and here's all the other places that I'm showing online. So schema is something that can kind of help Google understand your, your brand and your business better. Okay. As long as you have those components, the actual platform doesn't matter. You know, Google ranks content, not website platforms. So whilst I always kind of recommend WordPress, just purely because of the flexibility um, of that system, if it's overwhelming to you, and especially if you're starting out, then go with something that you can actually use and that's simple and focus on creating great content. Um, and, you know, most platforms you're going to be okay on actually. Amazing. That's great. Now, Karen, if you could start your career all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? I think I would do a marketing course earlier on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I feel like I took the, the long way around kind of learning everything. And I'm still, in fact, I, I had done a Facebook course yesterday that I was kind of up, topping up my education on. And what I would say as well is, <clears throat> you know, in, in with that is that all of these kind of ecosystems change on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really, I guess, realize that earlier on. When I first started doing SEO on my website in 2007, things were very different. And I ended up getting banned from Google in 2012. I know they came out with some new <laughs> algorithms and the, the way that my settings were on my website, I was breaching those and I didn't even know. Mm -hmm. You know, and if I had kept on top of that kind of... Um, information industry information yeah then I wouldn't have been caught out like that so there was some t tough learnings from that I had to literally start with a, a new website yeah. but now I have kind of alerts set up in my phone where I have kind of focus on whether it's kind of Facebook and um, obviously SEO I uh, look at the check out the Google kind of dev blog on a regular basis you know I keep up to date with industry news and I think those types of things are actually really important so if I could go back I would have approached that differently for sure okay. um, so I think the key things is not buying a whole load of kit right away and really kind of almost building in time to your structure to keep up to date with marketing best practice the marketing trends and finding out those resources and then creating a bit of a kind of you know a list of links to kind of useful trusted resources so that you can you can keep on top of that and you don't get caught out with things like you know I've seen people have their Facebook pages removed or bans from Facebook mm -hmm. and it's not been they've not been aiming to do anything um, yeah. underhand but <clears throat> they've just the, the terms and conditions have changed and they didn't realize you know and it's, it, and it's caught them out so keeping on top of that type of thing I think right from the start for sure definitely and if you can add one final piece of advice maybe something that's made a big difference to your business life or your personal life what would that one piece of advice be I think a uh, kind of um, openness and collaboration with others in the industry mm -hmm. um, although we all have our moments I think that the photography community is really friendly and there's a lot of things that as a community we do to support each other yeah. you know putting kindness and patience at the forefront of our dealings with each other means that we can really kind of build some um, great trusted relationships mm -hmm. that um, will help us both in terms of our photography skill and pushing ourselves to do better and, <clears throat> and to um, uh, you know achieve kind of higher levels of maybe creativity or try new things out and it's also an opportunity to shoot with other photographers as well and I know myself like even from you know 25 years of photography or whatever if I go and I'm second shooting at another wedding on Sunday and I know I'm going to learn new things you know because there'll be different approaches that the main photographer takes to me and I think having those opportunities where you kind of really put yourself in situations where you can kind of learn and continue to grow your creativity is such a valuable thing and I feel like back in 2005 maybe the the um the the kind of culture was a little bit different yeah. but social media has really helped bring people together so I think if you're new and you're starting out in the industry 
join some Facebook groups. If you're not sure which ones to join, send me a message, reach out on Facebook, and I would happily make some recommendations because I think that industry kind of community spirit has has been really a kind of positive um, aspect to my career. And if anything, I wish I'd joined some of these groups sooner because it's been great from both a kind of just making some friends and uh, also stretching myself creatively. You know, I've just bought a whole bunch of different flash guns based on recommendations from um, some helpful people in America that I've never met um, that were only too happy to, you know, take time out of their their busy day to make a whole bunch of recommendations that saved me a whole bunch of cash as well. <laughs> um, so I think that community thing is so important and really, really valuable and overall really friendly and helpful. I definitely agree. I think there's a real, like, you can have that real sense of camaraderie can't you in in the absolutely industry. And like you've always even people that you've not met there's always someone that's got your back there's always somebody that'll give you a hand there's always someone that'll jump in to help you so yeah that's that's definitely a really good one if our listeners would like to find out a little bit more about you Karen if they'd like to get in touch if they'd like to um learn more about photo seo lab how can they do that so they can head to photoseolab.com. Um, on the homepage, I have a free SEO audit, actually. So if they want to just do a quick temperature check in terms of where their SEO is up to, it's completely free. You'll get a PDF pretty much instantly um, that gives you a brutal but honest score. <laughs> <laughs> and things might be better than you're expecting. So, you know, it might not be, it might not be um, bad. Uh, but that's something that anyone can help themselves to. Um, my email inbox is open. So you know, if anybody's got any either SEO questions or even just industry questions about photography, you know, they can fill in the contact form on my website or reach out on Facebook um, and I'd be happy to kind of guide or kind of answer any SEO related questions. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. I've learned loads. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely Thank loads. Um, and I think I'm going to go and run that SEO audit myself now. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Help yourself amazing thank you so much for your time Karen and hopefully we'll be able to catch up again soon awesome all right cheers See you soon. bye okay guys that's everything from me today thank you so much again to Karen for coming and joining us it was amazing to hear all of those tips and I know that you guys and me will be running off to our websites now to implement all of those things that she's taught us already if you would like to see the show notes you can head to www.studioninja.co forward slash episode 34 please don't forget to rate us on the podcast platform that you're listening on a little bit of love goes a very long way I'll see you next time Thanks for listening to this episode of NinjaCast, brought to you by Studio Ninja. Beautifully designed and super easy to use, Studio Ninja will help you manage your leads, clients, shoots, invoices, contracts, workflows, and so much more. To learn more or start your 30-day free trial, go to www.studioninja.co.